Today I'll be talking about happiness in life and in politics with Robert Habeck, author and deputy premier of the German state of Schleswig-Holstein. Welcome to the interview on DW, Mr. Habeck. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And welcome to you too, viewers. My name is Thomas Spahn. Mr. Habeck, your party, the Greens, almost chose you as its lead candidate for the general election this autumn. The upside is that you can carry on surfing on the Baltic with your four sons, which would be difficult in Berlin. That's one way to see it. I would have liked to win to help my party at this critically important time, and also to some extent for my own sake. I feel a greater need than ever to take an active role in politics. I'm doing that in Schleswig-Holstein, but would have liked to work at the national level. But yes, I do now have more time for surfing. You have spent time at home with your children and written books together with your wife, Andrea Paluch. That is quite unusual. How does it work writing together? And why does it work? It was first and foremost about the kind of life we wanted to lead, not about writing together. We wanted a shared profession and a family together. So writing was our way to shape a life together. In technical terms, we read our novels out loud to each other. We started by translating poetry. One of us would prepare a rough draft and then read it to the other. Verse with fixed measures and old-fashioned language. It took a number of bottles of wine to find the right rhymes and rhythms and structure. So when we wrote our own long pieces of prose, we built on that cooperation. They were spoken novels, which led to a distinctive style of our own. Paolo Habeck is a virtual author and does not really exist. It is more than the sum of our two parts and something different. Some writers don't find any readers, unlike yourself. You've received awards and made money and also raised your children at home. Was that the happiest period of your life? I don't know about that. The present is also a happy time. I can let rip in my political life, and though the children are older, we still have a very close relationship. It is different, of course. It's freer. I don't sing them to sleep anymore. I have no regrets. I am happy being who I am. It was an incredibly intense time we spent together. Both my wife and I accumulated so much happiness and experienced so much togetherness that our batteries will remain fully charged for many, many years. Some people miss out on their children's childhood, but not me. Those were 12 fantastic years. We were able to make a living with our writing and feed our family, and then came politics as the next challenge. Your latest book is about your life in politics and your ideas about politics. You write that it's a tough business. And you claim that Sisyphus, who had to roll a huge rock up a mountain and then have it roll back down upon him over and over again, was a happy person. Why? In general, people do not expect somebody to come along and free them. They all have their own ideas. There are laws and rules and institutions, the EU, coalitions, parliaments. It's all about negotiations. Grueling negotiations. Yes, grueling negotiations, but you have to welcome them. Donald Trump says time for empty talk is over, now arrives the hour of action, thereby abandoning the basis for any social consensus and democracy itself. Dialogue, having to make an effort to reach agreement, hammering out a common path, that is what constitutes society. You rarely get your way 100%. You have to accept and welcome compromise. It is a challenge that leads you to the next step, hence the comparison to Sisyphus. Punished by the gods, he has to roll a rock up a mountain and see it roll back down again for all eternity. The philosopher Camus said Sisyphus affirms his fate and therefore must feel happy, as I do too. When the rock reaches the peak, it does not roll back. 
You just have to roll it up the next mountain. The great thing about a society is that it's never completed. You say the political world ought to be optimistic and face reality. That can be hard. Here, in Schleswig-Holstein and across Germany, people say they want a new eco-friendly energy policy but don't want new power lines in their backyard. How do you resolve such problems? But that's not the case in Schleswig-Holstein. In my modest sphere of activity, people may not want power lines next door, but they accept them. But they end up going past somebody's backyard. Politicians have to talk to people. The difference between my state and the national level is that in Schleswig-Holstein we are committed to the power line project. We don't outsource communications to a PR firm. We politicians go out and talk to the people ourselves. We look them in the eye and explain the project. I've spent many a night in crowded halls listening to the catcalls. But eventually the protests ended and people started to assume responsibility for the power line. And now we're building it at double the speed and it incorporates good ideas that emerged locally. We're more constructive and faster than before. I don't accept the cliché that people just dig in their hills and say no. Responsibility means making things happen. When people assume responsibility, they are empowered to get involved. And here we are seeing what that can lead to. What about the bigger picture? Europe is breaking up. Russia and Turkey are dismantling democracy. And you mentioned Donald Trump. The U.S. is just looking out for itself now. It's everyone for themselves. How can you still be optimistic? Commitment and consistency help. When the refugees arrived in Germany, we saw how willing people were to help. Later, everything that was considered right and good was depicted as wrong. That certainly does not encourage people to be optimistic about politics. I believe responsibility lies with the main players. They have to tell it like it is, say what the problems are, and that includes accepting hesitation and doubt, and admitting to not being sure about things. Anything else is implausible. Nobody always knows the right course of action. Only the Chancellor and the Foreign Minister have to pretend to know everything, but nobody believes them anyway. Still, on the basis of a set of values, these are the major challenges and these are the values we will not betray. If you remain true to that, then people might join that conviction. We are seeing people turn away from democracy in the US and Europe, in Poland, but not in Germany, I hope. That has less to do with issues of substance than with people's despair when they are told there is no alternative. So there's no proper debate about values. People lose confidence in politics and look for alternatives. And when there's no serious opposition in sight, they turn to any old half-baked extremists. We need a different kind of politics. But isn't there a deeper problem? The potentates in Turkey, the US and Hungary didn't come to power by means of elections that went wrong or were not democratic. They were voted into office the normal way. Does that not prove that democratic procedures and democratic values do not always go hand in hand? They do by necessity belong together. But not always. Yes, but then they are no longer democracies. If freedom of the press is curtailed as in Turkey, or if democratic institutions are compromised as in Hungary, or come under attack as in Poland, or when Trump issues a frenzy of executive orders, then they are no longer functioning democracies, not in the true sense of the word. The rule of law is a precondition of democracy because confidence in laws being respected and that elected representatives will abide by them too is essential to democracy. If you look at China, you might say capitalism and democracy do not necessarily go together, but that is another story. The rule of law is central to democracy and the struggle to uphold it determines every democratic dispute. 
in einer rechtsstaatlichen und demokratischen In the free and fair vote in January by Green Party members on who will lead the party into the upcoming general election, you lost to Cem Özdemir, a well-known figure throughout Germany, by 76 votes. Are you proud it was so tiny a margin? No, I feel neither proud nor disappointed. It was an odd outcome because many people congratulated me. But it did not feel like a victory, and I didn't win. Cem won. He is the lead candidate, and I congratulated him. I will support him in any way I can. Not disappointed? No. It was always more likely I would lose than win, so disappointment is not the right word. There was a brief period of reorientation, and that included three or four days of disorientation. Mr. Habeck, our time is almost up. We like to end the interview by asking our guests to complete three sentences. My role model as a politician is... Václav Havel, the Czech president and philosopher. He was always a bit of a hero, both in what he wrote and the way he lived. My role model as a writer is... Max Frisch. There was a time I thought him a bit tacky, but his way of seeing the human animal is always so gripping. I've stopped questioning its intellectual validity. I just find it great. For me, novels such as Homo Faber, Gantenbein and I'm Not Stiller are guiding stars. For me, happiness means being able to let go of things. Happiness means living a life of freedom. Robert Habeck, many thanks. Thank you.